And hello everybody, thank you so so much for tuning in, you are watching The Vuyo Show, we are coming to you live from New York City and um, uh, we have a very special episode lined up for you today, I mean I've been waiting all week for this conversation to be had. You might see on the corner of the screen there are some bottles that you can see and you're probably wondering Vuyo what is that, what's going on? Now I want to ask you to please sit back, relax because we're going to be enjoying the next couple of minutes together with myself, the guest that's joining us and these goodies in front of us, right? <laughs> I am your favorite global darling, Vuyo Chamoda, and um, I'm so honored, I'm so excited, and I'm so privileged to be introducing this guest, ladies and gents, a global entrepreneur, the founder and CEO of this incredible brand called Muwedi Wines, and she's going to be telling us a little bit more about what does it mean running a global empire. And that's what we're going to be discussing on the show today. So please, wherever you are from around the world, please put your hands together for the one and only Lisejo. Hey. Woo -woo. <laughs> <laughs> we just need a studio audience okay. to finish to, to finish that up so we can clap and give you that round of applause because Aww, you so much you. deserve it. Thank you. I appreciate How? it, guys. <laughs> really, for real. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm very well, Buyo, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for like hosting me and my colleague Malaika. Yeah. Um, I'm even better in New York City, so it's such a sweet privilege to be here. You look Appreciate amazing, it. first and foremost. I know our audience is like, oh, child. Yeah. <laughs> that look isn't put together, and it looks fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know we need to show up, of right? Of course. Yeah. You got to do it. You got to do it right. And, and Absolutely. Today is all about showing up. Today is, yep. is all of the conversation we're going to be having. I think the premise of us being even here today together mm -hmm. is, is all about what that looks like. Absolutely. Um, but I, I'd love for you to, to please just do a quick intro of yourself. Um, I did I did my best in kind of no, railing awesome. up the audience, but I know yeah. there's so much more that um, kind of falls under the bracket of an introduction for you. Yeah. No, I think you did a fantastic job. <laughs> Guys, I'm done. Bye. <laughs> uh, no, um, my name is Lesejo Holds Upful, and I am um, originally from Mafiking. It's a small, it's the capital of the Northwest province, believe it or not, although some people like to think Rustenburg is, but no. Um, and I grew up in, in Mafi Gang, went to boarding school in a small dorpy called Freiburg. So Freiburg is between Kimberley, if you've heard of Kimberley Diamonds or anything. Um, it's right there. So, you know, like rural vibes, farm vibes, and um, pretty much went to boarding school um, at a small town called Freiburg. It's between Kimberley and Mafi Gang. And there's a beautiful boarding school there. Um, it actually used to be a former... Uh, British boarding school um, way back when by it was started by the London Missionary Society so if you look at our history there are several schools that were start, started by the London Missionary Society one was Lovedale in the Eastern Cape and that's where Nelson Mandela went to um, the the Mbekis went there and I mean these schools were known to sort of like educate um, Africans that were to make a difference in the continent right so my school which is situated in the Northwest province um, my grandmother had the privilege of going there in fact, the missionaries found her in the middle of a village, um, her village in the Northwest, and she was herding cattle um, because her parents couldn't afford to take her to school. And, and the British missionaries um, enrolled her. She became a teacher, and she was part of like starting several schools like in Northwest Province and other parts of the Eastern Cape as well. So education has always been like a cornerstone like in our family. So even with that, people like Ruth Mompati, so Ruth Mompati, um, is like a like a struggle hero, I would say, um, because she was Nelson Mandela's secretary and Tutu's, um, sorry, and or Tambo's secretary um, at their law firm way back when. But these were women that um, have poured so much into my life. I've looked up to them because of their resilience um, and the desire to do better, especially when they, you know, coming from the rural area. So um, they, they are some of the alumni from that school, including my, my grandmother. So the school was shut down in the 1960s because of apartheid laws. So people were not allowed actually to get that type of education. Black people were not allowed to get that type of education. Mm -hmm. And so the school was reopened in 1997. That's when my grandmother was like, Mdanam, you're going back to that school and you're gonna continue the family legacy. Even though I didn't know what that looks like, <laughs> but I felt like you know I was given a big responsibility as, as a young person. But also, I think looking at where South Africa was then and where we are going, um, I couldn't leave it to someone else. It's on us. 
mm -hmm. um, to do something. And you know, I think one of the things that I've learned from people like Umama Ruth, um, my grandmother, is that we need to like take up spaces. We need to be present. We need to speak up. Um, even when our voices are quivering or whatever, we, we need to be there and mm -hmm. say something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been philosophy behind me being an entrepreneur um, and being um, a social, yeah, social entrepreneur, philanthropist, you know, some of the NGOs that, that I've started in South Africa, it's more about like, what is my role as a South African, um, you know, in terms of like giving back to my country, being part of like building my country, but also like being an example for like the upcoming generation that everything is possible when you put your mind to it. And we need to um, occupy spaces like we do. <laughs> and you've definitely done that, right, in different capacities. And we're going to unpack all of that today. Totally, yeah. Right, and we're going to just understand what the landscape of that looks like. Because taking up space requires a lot of guts, as one would say, a yep. lot of um, courage. Absolutely. Right? Um, Absolutely. What would you say about your growing up, right, as you're sharing about these different women that, that really instilled the, that bravery and that courage inside mm -hmm. of you? Um, that then kind of, because a lot of people could say that that's, that was their similar upbringing, but they didn't take those skills. Right. What about you? Did, did the, how do those principles make sense to you that you were able to just take them and, and go forth with them um, that you think were relevant to you um, as a young, as a young little girl? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I think for me, um, you know, when you're a young person, sometimes you think that, and this is just based on my personal experience. Um, I've shared during our launch that, you know, some of the experiences that have shaped my life or my journey has been like losing my parents. And that for me was like very transformative. Um, also in a positive way, because I feel like there was like a moment of like an awakening for me where I realized that even in my loss, I do have a sense of responsibility. You know, I, I do need to step in for other people. And I think what shaped me was when f people that I was not even related to, because sometimes when you're facing tragedy in your life um, or things fall apart, could be anything, we expect our family members to step in. And sometimes that's not the case. Um, and I think even when, and there's nothing wrong. Like sometimes if people don't, sh people that you expect to show up for you and they don't show up for, for you, it's okay, mm -hmm. right? Because um, I'm a believer, um, I'm a follower of Jesus. I do believe that God will always send people, um, you know, in a form, like angels are in a form of humans yeah. most of the time to open doors for you. And that's exactly what, what happened, you know, in my, in my case, I had, Literally, like, people, like, teachers who stepped in, like, who believed in me, who invested so much in me that I'm like, oh, my goodness, um, why do these people believe in me so much? I'm like, okay, I can't let them down, right? <laughs> like, the bar is already, like, set high. And it's not like they have an expectation for me to, like, give back or do whatever, but I, I, I just thought, you know, the generosity or the love that they've showed me, the poured into my life, really shows that I am capable. Like, there's something unique in me. And I, and I, and I, and I think also how we change our perspective in terms of like the struggles that we go through. I mean, losing my parents was like hard. I mean, it's still hard, right? Yeah. So you, I have moments of like grief. I'm like, like last week when I was like, I wish they were there, you know, for my New York launch. But I'm like, I've, I've learned to be like resilient. I've learned to be like independent. I've learned to work hard and I've learned to be like intentional. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause I think one thing that I've learned is that we don't live forever. And we're here for a reason. I mean, my mom passed away in her early 40s, so has my dad. And I think about the dreams, because they were both very ambitious. Like, my mom was actually like a photographer. Um, my, my dad was a vo voiceover artist, you know. Um, so they were both creative. So living, growing up in a household like, of creatives that were like doing all sorts of like things from like, I, would go, I, I grew up in like a studio, so I would go to like a studio <laughs> with my dad. Like, do you know what I'm even coming here to your studio? Like, it reminds me of that. Um, and, I, and I visit their graves and I look at heaps of soil or now it's like tombstone. Um, over them, over 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 where they're buried, it's like it's all those dreams and hopes and whatever that are buried there that they never got to, um, I guess, achieve. Some they have achieved, and I and I think of myself as someone who has been given a chance. So every day when I wake up, I think about, okay, I've been given today. What can I do, right? And it's not like even when you pursue something that you're passionate about, it's not like you're not gonna have fear. But how, how do you face that fear and tell that fear to like, shut up, yeah. excuse my, my, my French, like fear, be quiet yeah. and like hope arise. Okay. So many times, even launching Moedi, launching some of the startups I've done, like it's like sometimes fear, like I'd be so scared. But I think the courage of 
thinking about where are the opportunities that other people didn't have, like my parents, um, it, I think it's a motivation for me to be like re resilient and um, and push through. Even if things don't don't work out, it's okay. I at least I have the badge that I've tried. You know, yeah. yeah. And how old were you when, when you lost your parents? Um, and, and would you say your relationship with, with God and with Christ um, played a role in, in ensuring that you continue? Because it could break someone else, right? Someone Absolutely. else would just stop, right? Yeah. But do, would you say that that played a role in, in helping? And how old were you when, when you lost Yeah, so my, 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 so my dad and my grandmother actually died like two weeks apart from each other. Oh. So my grandmother, you know, sometimes parents are not supposed to have favorites, but you know how some grannies have like favorites. Um, so my, my dad was like my grandmother's favorite, I would say, because she died from like heartbreak. It was the first time ever seeing someone like just, because her son passed away first and she just like could not process that. And then for me, there was like a tragic loss. So this is like the grandmother who's always been like, you know, the matriarch, like in our family, yes. like, you know, she inspired so many people in my family to get educated. So my family's full of like professionals, sorry, like teachers and, you know, um, and it's because of her, you know? I mean, it's also because of the, um, the missionaries that saw something in her and gave her the chance. And so mom, uh, dad passed away when I was 11 and grandmother. And then um, when I was 14, my mom passed away. And that for me was really hard because I grew up in the Methodist church. So my mom went to ZCC, but you know, we always follow our, our dad's religion. So I went <laughs> yes. to the Methodist church. Um, and, um, and I think even as a young person, then as a teenager, you don't think about like church and J, you know, you go to like, Easter, yes. and then after Easter, you know, it's Christmas, but I, I wouldn't say I had a person, I knew who Jesus was or anything, I was more of like a, it was more like religious, yeah. um, and I think um, the boarding school that I went to was a Christian, I was actually recruited to join like a Christian fellowship um, by one of my friends, Tofazo. And she used to tell me about this, like, born again. I was like, hey, what's this born again? You guys, like, how many times? Like, Easy. Yeah. And, you know, as a teenager in boarding school, yeah, like, yeah, the boys, you know, like, it's your chance to, like, yeah. um, be you. You're away from, like, family. And this one is, like, telling me about this Jesus. You know, and one day I just decided to um, go. They had a crusade on campus. Um, it used to be called SCM, the organization. So I went to this crusade, and they're like, those who want to give their lives to God, go up front. I was like, yo, let me go. Let me see what's going to happen, because yeah. yo, Tsongho Fatso won't leave me. Um, and Tsongho Fatso's parents are like pastors, okay. so you can imagine. Yeah. So, um, we, so, so I go there, give my life to Christ, go back to my dorm, and that afternoon I had a dream. And in this dream, my mom is like, oh, I've been waiting for this moment. Um, I'm going to leave. Um, but God is going to take care of you, like, don't worry. But it was one of those strange dreams, like, you, you know, you, like, there are dreams that you, like, feel. It's almost like it's real, and I could, like, feel her, and by then she was not feeling okay. She was, like, in hospital. And I woke up, and I told Tseho, I was like, Tseho, you know, I think my mom is going to pass away. She's like, hey, bro, like, why would you, <laughs> like, go, go back to sleep, you know? And, yeah, and, and she passed away, like, I think two, uh, or a day or two after, after, after that. And my family came over. And you know how our fam our African families are not, like, direct. You know, they're like, oh, Lisa, you have to come home. I'm like, for what? No, there's something that you need to do at home. And there's, like, you know, I look around. There's, like, my uncle, my cousin, my this. Yes. And everybody's, like, welling up. You know, they're not telling me. I'm like, guys, why don't you tell me that my mom passed away? It's like, how do you know? I'm like, I just, I, like, I, I just, I just knew. And I think for me, that was like really tough because it was hard to um, connect the loving God. Like I, I, it was hard for me to make sense of God being loving at the same time, taking people that I love and leaving me an orphan. Like I, I really had a hard time. And I remember like after a few weeks where I just left, I was left so broken. And it doesn't matter how many times people show up for you at the funeral, they tell you the story, and, you know. Um, you still have this void yeah. and you realize that this void can only be filled by God, like nothing else. And I remember I came back from school one, one day and I was sitting on, on my bathroom floor um, at, the, at the boarding house and I just felt like this presence and literally God saying like, I'm here, like I'm, I'm your father. Um, and, I, and I really, that was like transformative for me because I started seeing God not, not as like God, like Father God, you know, baby Jesus, like, no, no, no. I started feeling, <laughs> you know, seeing God as like my father. Yeah. Um, so there's a scripture that says, even if my father and my, your, my, my mother and my father uh, would, would, would leave, like, but God will be like with you, like yeah. he's going to take care of you. And even scriptures like um, Isaiah 60, talk, talking about taking care of like the orphans, the, the, the widows, what is true fasting. I think when I lost my parents, the, the, 
the gospel became more tangible, more real. So on That's Wednesday, well. right, yeah. so on Wednesday I spoke about volunteering with um, Rotary Club and going to like orphanages. I could actually feel, the gospel became more real because I could actually feel Jesus sitting amongst the, the hurting kids, you know, mm -hmm. HIV positive kids that were about to die at the, the orphanages that we would visit. He was there in our pain, you know, it wasn't like he was far, you can't, you can't reach him, like he's, he's there. Yeah. And even if you, it doesn't make sense, there's lessons that he wants you to like learn. You know, even if it's painful, like you have to go through something. Unfortunately, there are things that you can't skip, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, just to cut the long story short, um, that's where my faith began to grow. Um, I mean, in boarding school, I literally would host like Bible studies. I would pray for people because I, I just knew that I, I had to trust God. And the fact that the school gave me like scholarships to finish, this, the fact that I got to do all these other things, even that kids with parents did not even have the ability to do God open door. When he said, I'm going to take care of you, like, guys, for real, like, he, he, he's that father. Mm. Yeah. And there's a scripture that says, I'll never leave nor forsake you. Yeah. And I think in this case, yeah. you, you could definitely see yeah. in, in, in the story. Um, and I heard a pastor saying in a, in a sermon once that some of the things that we go through are so that we can have these testimonies and then be able to, to testify about God. Absolutely. And testify about his power. Absolutely. Even though it's hard, because I can it only is. imagine, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but look, at, look at the strength that you hold now. Yeah. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna touch base now in, in a sec about all these incredible things in front of us. But I, I'm so glad that you are able to share a bit of that story. Yeah. Um, because out, outside of all of this, I think in essence, knowing who you are yeah. and the strength that you get to carry, yeah. we'll give context to how far you've been able to go with business as well. Yeah. No, absolutely, uh, <laughs> absolutely. But I love what you said, like no, knowing who you are, because yeah. when you're anchored in God and knowing your identity in God, who God says you are. I mean, you're unshakable because yeah. you, you're, you're going knowing that God is sending you, right? And you know who you are. And at what point do you then, to some degree, forgive God, right? Or, or understand the reason behind the journey that he's taken you on that you then began to trust him again? Because I'm, I'm, And I'm saying this because there might be someone who is in that kind of battle right now mm. within themselves to mm. say... Um, I have God, I've accepted Christ, I have, you know, taken that, that, that pledge. But now I, I don't understand why these things are happening or why this is happening to me right now. Um, and seeing you having come out from the other end of mm. that, um, how did you navigate that forgiveness of, 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 to him mm. and then also accepting what has, what has occurred and then moving forward from there? Yeah, I think um, for me it was a blessing being surrounded by um, you know people that were pouring into my spiritual walk, yeah. because there are there were moments where I had like doubts, and you know you're like a spiritual baby. Even the Bible talks about it. Like when you're a spiritual baby, you need to have milk. Like, <laughs> <Not fat. laughs> like any exactly, you can't order croissant. No, <laughs> um, and I think having that community of believers, people yeah. that pray for you. Um, that believe with you, that walk with you, um, and that don't, you know, judge you. Even when you ask questions like, God, where were you? Yeah. And that's a valid question. That's a va and, and the relationship that God wants us to have with him is that of, of a father and, and child. You know, he's not like someone who's there, like, oh, bra God. Yeah. Like, no, 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 no. He's but like... On Sunday only. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can just ask, like, Daddy, my heart is, like, so broken. I don't even know what to do. And sometimes there are days where I'm like, I don't have words my tears are like my prayers, yeah. you know, like, and you will really like, and I think relenting, like learning to like give everything because you're not going to have answers to everything. But in time, you know, um, in time, God will reveal to you why certain things happened to you, right? Even, even the most painful things, I know, um, but, 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 but he, will, he will reveal it to you. But then sometimes you have to go through that process f to help someone else along the way or to strengthen you, like in my case, I feel like I could actually stand in for orphans, you know, like that's why I'm such a big advocate for like education and orphans, the fatherless, like I wanna, I wanna, I wanna see them being who God has call, called them to be because when you don't have a mom or a dad or you don't have people standing up for you, you feel lost, Yeah. you know, you can go east or west, so yeah. And, and I'm interested in just, because again, I'm also a believer, so yeah. I, I kind of bring it to you there. Um, a scripture that says, my plans are to prosper and not to harm you, mm -hmm. but to give you hope in the future. In the conversation that you then had with God and you're growing up and becoming a young adult, mm -hmm. 
what if God say your plan, the plan that he has for you, or to, one could say your purpose yeah. is um, not only based on what you've gone through, but also based on your identity. Mm. What did, did, did you have that conversation with God, or it's something that you kind of felt like kind of arose naturally from you? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, so it, it all started with my, the relationship that I had with my dad. So I was very, very close to my dad. I was actually like my dad's princess. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, in light of him like leaving this world, um, I, I saw, I felt like God saw me as such as well. His royal um, priesthood, like I was God's princess as well. Like I always see myself as this little girl, like in front of, even now, like I'm a mom, <laughs> but I'm still like this God's like little girl. And uh, one of the things that my dad um, did for me was he literally spoke positive t positivity like into my life. He always told me that that like there's nothing that I could I couldn't do, and that gave me like confidence. Yeah. Literally, like I'm like I could do anything. I'm like this girl from my gang, like could do anything, you know. Um, I remember my dad, even my mom used to tell me like you're gonna be traveling all over the world, you're gonna be doing all these things, and I was like young back then, but I I believed it, you know, even though like. I don't know, Jobek was like far from us, you know, but like, <laughs> I'm like one day, you know, I'm going to be in the U.S. Um, and, and starting to believe what, what God says about you. And I, and I think for me, um, to your scripture, uh, you know, his plans are, are bigger than our plans. Yeah. You know, he has, he's, he has bigger plans for, for us, hope for, he's given us hope for the future, right? So I'm like, God, I know that what you have for me, um, you know, and you honor the desires of my heart, right? And, and also, there's not selfishness to it. Like, what I do, my prayer is, God, whatever that I do, I want it to be in your honor. I want people to know that you are alive and, and you are real. And you could use the smallest things that don't even make sense to, to the world to turn things around to your glory. And, and God can pick up it like a nobody. Literally, I know sometimes people take that light, but I'm, I'm just telling you, people can, God can use anything for his glory. And my prayer every day is that, Lord, help me not to sort of, help me not to allow maybe the fame or the whatever or the success to, um, I guess, overshadow me. Like, I want it to still be for your glory. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So that's like my everyday prayer now. Like, I want people to know God through my journey. Mm. And what I like uh, about your, what your story is you saying yes to the calling and to the purpose and to the journey. Mm. Um, because as you're saying, God can use anyone. And if you mm. didn't say yes, he was going to use someone else. But you said yes. Yes. And, yes. and you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you're yeah. like, yes, Lord, use yeah. me. You yeah. know, in whatever way, shape, or form. Mm. So I, I'd say thank sure. you for saying yes. No, to, thank you. To that, right? Thank you. And I think also it's um, going back to the scripture, like trust, trusting in the Lord with all your heart. Mm. Like every day, even when things seem impossible, I was like, okay, God, you told me about faith. You said, with all your heart, not half my heart. <laughs> And sometimes I'm like, God, let me try to so solve this. I'm, he's like, what does the word say? Trust in the Lord with all, your, like oh, everything. Yeah. Every fiber in your being. Yeah. That's what they say. I didn't ask <laughs> you to help me figure out a solution. Because <laughs> sometimes we do that. We're we like, do. okay, one plus one is two. God, yeah. why is it not doing right now? I'm out of time. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and I love that. Um, and so education being a big part of, of your, your, your growing up and your upbringing um, and being instilled in you really. Where does entrepreneurship come in? Because that's a different kind of ball game in and of itself. Yeah. Um, when did I, when did you get introduced to to the world and to the, even the concept and the idea of entrepreneurship? First of all, Jesus had a ministry and he was a carpenter. Yes. Um, so, well, it's true. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my grandmother. So my mom also had like side businesses, a okay. couple of side businesses, and my grandmother, the one who was a teacher, also had businesses. My paternal side, my grandfather was a farmer. He was actually one of the biggest farmers um, in that region, like in the Northwest. So I learned by entrepreneurs in my family, especially like my grandparents on both sides, really inspired me. I just knew that, because um, entrepreneurs essentially like solve a problem, right? Yeah. Um, so I grew up in the Northwest, so my grandfather was a primary farm, uh, um, yeah, primary farmer. So he did grains, he did vegetables, he had cattle. I mean, um, like literally anything in agriculture and he also did processing as well wow. so they would actually take like the maize to like the mill so there was a mill in town that was owned by a co-op and they would turn that into like maize meal like pop and all of that so when you grow up um, being surrounded by that already your mind is like stimulated you know do you know what i mean like you're in that problem solving you're like okay now that my grandfather could turn this into pop what else can I do? Maybe we could do like yogurt or, you know, do you know what I mean? Like those, I think there was always like ideas like around the table. Whenever we would have dinners around the tables, there's like innovation, like, and it was like fun. But you don't realize it as kids because 
you think it's just a conversation like a G, but you, you don't realize that it's actually like inside of you, like it, it lives in you. And I think um, when I decided to, and also the influence of my grandf grandmother on education was still there. So I feel like I was sort of, I was either going the entrepreneurial route or I was going the education route, which yeah. I feel like I both did um, at, at different points. So I did it in, um, so I, I actually became a volunteer teacher right after high school. Um, because I've always been interested in like education yeah. and the fact that some kids, um, especially in rural areas or townships, seem to be falling off the cracks if they don't get like support. And it's easier for us to like blame the teachers or blame, blame, blame the moms, you know what I mean? But I'm just like, okay, what is it that the, these, what kind of support do these students need? And I needed to immerse myself in that environment and yeah. just like understand. And I'm super grateful for that experience because um, I did that a year before starting university in America. And I think it gave me a mindset of like what I wanted to do. So initially I wanted to be a medical doctor, but I think it's one of those things that you have as a child, you're like, oh, I want to be a doctor. Be a like, doctor. I want to be a doctor. It's like that, that one profession. That yeah, <laughs> you're like, I want to be a nurse, you know? <laughs> but I realized, like, during my second year, I was like, I actually don't want to be a doctor. So, so you somebody, went to medical school? No, I did pre-med. Oh, pre-med. Because okay. in America, you have to do, like, pre, pre four okay. years of pre-med, yeah. and then you have to apply for medical school, and then yeah. you have to apply for residence. I was like, yo, guys, by the time I finish, I'll be, like, 50. <laughs> 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 and all my friends that are doctors now, they're like in so much debt. I was like, ah, I'm sure there's another way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, I'm like, also, I, I don't like seeing blood, side of blood. I was like, I don't think I'll qualify. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah and, I, and, I, and, I, and I switched. So I was at a historically black college in Ohio called Wilberforce. Nice. Um, but my first introduction of America was New York City. So when I was um, 15, 16, when I came on an exchange program, so moving to Ohio, guys, Ohio is like country, guys. I was I've like, heard. I could not deal. Cornfield, I was like, I left Cornfield in the Northwest. <laughs> Northwest. Now I come, I see them here. I'm like, I can't. That's not what we came here for. No, 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 no. And they're movie. like, you're in America. I was like, mm, I'd, rather, I'd rather go to Joe Biden <laughs> <or Cape Town. laughs> So I yeah. transferred, I switched, and I um, studied at City College. So I did the last few years of, of my studies here in New York at okay. City College on okay. 137th Street. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was great because my focus was on international studies and, and business, which was like amazing. I did like um, micro, uh, micro and microeconomics as well. And I, and I think that sort of like sparked that business side of, of me, the passion that I've had, but it's like, it was laying there. It was yeah. like dormant. Um, and, I, and I think also living here uh, in America, I would always be frustrated by the fact that it was hard for us to find South African products like on the shelves. Oh, for sure. And also I got frustrated by the fact that people related to Africa from a sense of like poverty and not from a sense of like the other beautiful things that are coming from poverty. So I, listen, I just had to prepare myself emotionally whenever someone would say something those, weird. Those statements and those questions. Like, did you grow up riding a lion? And I was like, yo, I did. <laughs> Do you have because, in your backyard? Yeah, I'm like, yo, guys, I'm like, there's a lot of education here. <laughs> I'm like, I'm here, I'm coming here for education, but actually it's the other way around. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I, and I think, um, you know, how America, I guess, uh, trades with Africa or relates with Africa, I felt like it needed to, like, change. We needed yeah. to change the, the narrative. People needed to see what we could offer. I mean, we have minerals. Literally, we're like one of the richest countries yeah. like in the world from like mer minerals and things that we could supply from natural resources, like foods and stuff like that. And I just felt like it was unfair that, and not just South African products, I mean, products from other African countries, you'd have to yeah. go to like an ethnic store to yeah. find the product. I'm like, that's not right. There's one in a, in a, in a barrel. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm like, I want to see pop at Whole Foods. Like, let's, you know what I mean? I um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I think entrepreneurs really get into business because they want to solve a problem. And so that, that was like my why. Why is it that we don't have this? And why is it that when America co connects with Africa, it's more on like a, like a aid mm. platform? And I'm yeah. like, we're, we're not, we, we're capable, we, you know, we have skills. Um, I mean, there's so much that we can offer from a natural resource perspective. So I'm like, okay, that needs to change. That needs yeah. That game, I'm not appreciating it. <laughs> um, yeah, and I and I, I, I got involved. So after um, my undergrad, I moved to South Africa. I started my charity, Raise the Children, because we were talking about um, just challenges with orphans earlier. Yeah. 
And I thought, you know, I've been given such a privilege to study here, and I mean, I've, I've had amazing like experiences like in America, even job opportunities like in America. So going back to South Africa is like, what way can I give back or be part of like building back, you know, uh, or giving back to South Africa? And one way was um, starting an all, um, a scholarship often for a uh, uh, scholarship program for orphans mm -hmm. from r remote rural areas because I feel like um, a lot of the NGOs are centered around big cities like Cape Town, Joburg, yeah. Durban. But when you go out to like the Karoo or like the middle, like slightly in the middle of nowhere yeah. villages, there are kids who are like with incredible talent, but pe people never find out about them. Mm. They will never, because no one goes in, no NGO oh, wants yeah. to set, the, uh, set up there. And I was like, what about we find kids from these areas? We, um, you know, partner with like per uh, high performing schools like in, in South Africa. We have 15 school partners. Schools like St. Stevens is one of our school partners. Imagine if they're given that um, chance wow. to go to a prep school like that in South Africa. Yeah. They get the best of the best. Maybe they could be like the next Sia Colisi. They could yeah. be the next. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And sometimes we lose talent because people have not invested in that individual. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, and um, this year alone we enrolled 70 kids in 15 uh, private schools from grade eight. We found them from deep rural areas and we go and we ask the teachers, if the teachers don't wanna give us information, we go ask, you know, the, <laughs> the pastor, we go ask someone. Yes. And then when we, when we don't get the kids that we want, you know, we, we, you know, like that we feel like don't fit up, we go out and go to the village and we, until we find that kid it's who's like family. somewhere in like a shack somewhere, oh, we're like, we want you, when? Yeah. They're like, me, I'm like, yes, you, <laughs> you are going. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. And, and, and as you're sharing the story, I'm getting fragments, right? And, and the first being, when we're talking about the story of you were sitting on the table with, with, your, with your grandparents and your dad, your grandfather being um, running the farm, yeah. right? I'm getting a fragment from there and it's going to bring us back into yes. the products in front yeah. of us now. But then again, with your story of being an orphan, an orphan, an orphan and then that being a fragment that now you kind of re restructured that to give hope to others, right? Yeah. Then the third part being this bridge of yeah. you being coming to America and then having to figure out change, how do we change the narrative. So these three fragments Absolutely. that are all kind of collectively make up what we see and what we appreciate from you as, totally. as, a, as a person. Well, thank you. Um, but let's go to, to the first fragment, yes. right? Which is your grandfather having this farm. I was reading a book by Seth Gordon and he was talking about assertions. He was like assertions. Mm. Um, someone who started or who figured out that from, from the, the, um, the water that you get from peas, yep. you can make, I think, vegan whipped cream from it or something like that. Yep. But then before that, someone had to figure out that you can actually can foods. Yep. Before someone figured out you can actually can foods. Okay. Um, so basically this book was just talking about every single invention from the line of just, just a simple concept of yeah. the, 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 the whipped cream coming from the the water, I forgot what he said the water is called, that's in yeah. canned fruit. Yeah. But someone had to think about actually the, 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 the canned fruit staying over a long time. Someone had to think about actually canning fruit. fruit. Right. Someone had to think of, so these yeah. lines of different things yeah. that um, we now see as these great inventions yeah. came from certain assets. So someone was like, what if you yeah. did that and that? Yeah. So for you being in a farm and seeing your grandfather run the farm, yeah. did you have a what if? For your honey brand, was that how that came about? Were you sitting there and you were like, what if we could do this with that? I think my what if back then was more on efficiency. And I, I do appreciate that my grandfather provided jobs for so many people, literally, because he also um, used to plant cotton. Um, and so during harvesting, it's like hand harvested, right? So there would be like hundreds of people in the farm. I'm like, what if we came up with a process of like harvesting this? Because also cotton has like, needles like mm -hmm. you know so it's not actually like nice so you need to have like gloves and stuff like that so what if there was a way for us to like harvest this without really needing as many people even though at the same time we do need yes you know people need to get like you know employed in the in the village um and i think my mind has always been around like um value add beyond primary agriculture so um the honey concept actually started when i so I studied at the london school of economics and my whole focus at the London School of Economics was around how do we use business as a catalyst for social impact? Um, and how do we create businesses that create jobs, but also they're sustainable and we change the narrative, right? Uh, my whole idea was like, I wanna see the honey on the shelves of like Harrods, sh shelves of, um, you know, um, Whole Foods, any other specialty store, do you know what I mean? Yeah. With a story, 
right? Um, and and you. just um, figure, so coming back and thinking about what do we have in, in, in Africa, we have land. And um, um, a majority of the land we have is not even um, super productive, like we're not using it to produce food, right? Um, and so what, and we have a lot of people in rural areas that are looking for jobs, yeah. um, migrating to the city, looking, you know, like to, to find better opportunities. Like we see that people moving from Northwest to Joburg, people moving from Eastern East Cape, Cape to, do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. What if with the land that they have, cause you know, there's a lot of land, right? In rural areas. What if we actually commercialize that land and create opportunities there? Um, and so coming back from the LSC and after I worked on different projects like in India and other countries as well, I got excited to look at agriculture. I'm like, agriculture has a capacity to, um, create jobs like in South Africa. So I set up an agri hub um, in the middle of the, the Kalahari village, like a village called Manyeliti. Um, and I partnered with the various companies to provide like training um, that would allow people to learn how to farm, but also allow them to like access market. So it's literally like from point A to like point Z of the value chain, yes. they, they, they would be equipped. And obviously we started with, um, we did horticulture, so vegetable production. So with vegetables, having bees there, I didn't even realize this. Bees um, obviously are some of the biggest pollinators. They're not the only pollinators, but um, they're some of the critical um, pollinators. And so it makes sense, right? Because the minute you bring a hive into the farm, it actually affects your output in terms of um, the, the kgs of whatever that you've planted. If it's cabbage, your um, output becomes healthier, like your, your fruit becomes healthier. Um, and also um, you get honey, you know, yeah. honey is like one of the byproducts as well. And um, yeah, and, and I started re we started doing research uh, around beekeeping and, yeah. and trying to see how we could actually get our farmers to have hives to diversify the streams of income. Because, you know, sometimes when you're a primary producer, it takes you a long time to like sell your products, grow your products. So at least this could like supplement, you know, the yeah. times when they're not getting an income. And I read an, an, um, an article about South Africa being like a net importer of honey. I was like, hey, well, you know, it can't be. Um, so South Africa has production capacity of 2,000 of 2, tons of honey, actually 3,000 tons. Yeah. And we consume more than 5,000 tons of honey. The number of beekeepers in the country is declining due to, um, you know, unfair competitiveness um, in the field so within the national markets or yeah, just locally? yeah yeah okay locally because we tend to import a lot of like fake honey um, which is cheap honey so you can imagine if you're a beekeeper and you're selling a kg of honey for like 90 rand and a guy comes in with fake honey or blended honey from country x mm. and then they sell it in the market for like 30 rand mm. that's going to take you out of the market so there was a lot of that happening and I was like, you know, we need the beekeepers. One, because bees are declining in South Africa and we need the bee, uh, bees. So Albert Einstein actually has an, an interesting quote. He said, if bees were to be wiped out of the face of the earth, humans would only have four years to live. And that for me was that light bulb moment. I was like, yo guys, now I wanna live. Um, wow. Let's save the bees because if the bees are gone, we're like, we're all gone. <laughs> um, and that's where Bee Loved Honey um, story and journey started. Um, it's for the people, by the people, you know, bees for people and people for, for bees. Um, and as we're taking care of each other and, you know, the bees taking care of us, we, we, it's, it's a win-win. It's a win-win. Yeah. So we work with several organizations that um, provide uh, beehives or funding for, for beehives for young people in rural areas. Um, we train them. We buy back all the honey that they um, produce. And on our packaging, you'll see we tell a story about, you know, where our honey comes from and, and the impact. Because even for you as a consumer, you want to know that you're buying real honey. Yes. And unfortunately, in South Africa, we have a problem, not just in South Africa, all over the world. There's a huge challenge of local honey, like just floating around. So sometimes as a consumer, you don't even know if you're buying real honey or you're yeah. buying syrup. Yeah. That time you are sick and you're eating like syrup, you know. Wow. <laughs> And I mean, just apart from the story in itself, this is a beautiful thing. It's absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> Thanks. And then it should scream Africa because I'm like, <laughs> it's not mediocre. It's not. It, it, and the, the excellence and the quality, just even the bottle itself. I mean, you you wanna you wanna open this and, and take and taste whatever's inside or try whatever it's inside. So be loved. Yay. Absolutely love it. <laughs> um, and that being that being a product that not only is healthy yes is 
helping the, the, the community yep. economically, yep. but also sustainable. And yep. I've heard you speak about the sustainability element Absolutely. quite often, not only today, but on Wednesdays as yeah. well at the launch. Um, wh why go behind and advocate for, for sustainability um, in a world where everything is like, let's just go, let's, it doesn't matter, it doesn't yeah. matter. Um, but you kind of rallying behind that, why is that as well? I think, I mean, looking at South Africa, um, I mentioned this earlier, our unemployment rate, um, even in Africa, it's like super high. And there are things that um, we can look at them as a competitive advantage. I mean, we have um, land. Um, so to become a beekeeper, you don't need to be like a land owner. Okay. So the beauty is the bees do all the work. So you just have to check in, Jay, like, are they fine? Okay, cool. And then they continue. Um, and also trying to find ways we could, um, I think, get people involved in taking care of the environment because there's no planet B, like this is the only planet we have. Yeah. Like I want my great grandkids to also live in this planet to enjoy like the fresh air. And I mean, with, um, you know, climate change, we see it already, the weather patterns have changed. So this is serious, like this is real, right? And so if we could actually use beekeeping as a way of empowering people to earn an income and produce a product that is healthy for all of us and a product that actually help, helps us, I guess, problem solves the fear of whether I'm buying real honey or not. You know that I'm buying honey from this person and they're from the Eastern Cape or from, they're from Free State and they're getting real money. At the same time, they're playing a part, you're playing a part, they're playing a part in taking care of the environment through beekeeping. Yeah. 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 So that's why sustainability is like critical. Especially in, in, a, in a country like ours where it's not even something talked about really. You know, no. it, 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 yeah. it seems like a Western kind of conversation yeah. yeah but that you bring it back home as well and, and, I, and i'm also sure educating the people who are doing the work about absolutely. how they're they're factoring into sustainability that they might not even know that they are absolutely you know no uh, absolutely absolutely i mean even i mean beekeeping affects all the industries like if you think about the cotton industries you actually need bees to pollinate like cotton so the fashion industry if the bees are not there guess what um, you're not going to have. So really, we, we need, we need all, ecosystem, all parts of the economy, the ecosystem needs. And it's such a minute thing that you might not think about, but yeah. it's essential. It is essential. Like, yeah. it's super essential because um, without bees, guys, we have four years to live. That's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> and I, he was here when, long time ago, when he said that. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you can already see what the patterns, I mean, and even in wine industries, um, the biggest challenge right now that's facing the wine industry globally is climate change and global warming. Um, some regions are becoming more, they have um, extreme um, warmer weather than usual, like France. So the pattern of like um, grape protection has even changed because of that as, uh, as, as, uh, as a result. And some regions have become more favorable um, when it comes to like wine production. For example, regions like um, England, you know, England was never really like favorable when it comes to like growing grapes for, for wine production and all of that. And all of a sudden it's becoming warmer there. It's becoming like a favorable region for growing grapes. Okay. So do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that affects everything. It affects all of us. I mean, even in South Africa, we see that there are some years where the heat is like super high and, and it affects our output when it comes to us pr producing grapes for our wine. Um, so it is serious because it affects, it. like you're not going to have the same wine, guys. So we need to do our part. <laughs> we need to do our part. <laughs> and what I like is the education behind it as well. Yeah. It's not just, not just um, standing up for it, but also speaking up for it so that people can know this information. Because I know from this conversation, anyone's watching is like, okay, guys, I need to, now I need to be serious about my bees. Because yeah. Because if, yeah. if we're not supporting this, then we might be extinct soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so and the things that they can, yeah, yeah, and the thing that they can do, you can plant a garden. People are like, oh, I'm in Joburg or whatever I'm like or you're in a city um, even if you have a rooftop garden it's great yes. because bees actually need like forage so they they get nectar for, for the plant so what can you do at home you can actually plant a garden um, if you have roses if you have whatever anything that um, produces like nectar um, do that the bees will come will visit you and it's nice to have bees around and bees are friendly guys I'm telling you like sometimes I walk into a hive I, I open it bees are so calm you? no so if you are like if, if you, if, so bees are, are interesting. They can actually sense if you're like fearful or something, if you're scared, you know? So they will also try to like respond by like stinging you or, or fighting back. But if you're calm, if you, if you walk around bees and you're calm, they'll leave you alone. Don't swat them, don't do anything. They'll, they'll just leave you alone. That's, you see, that's valuable information. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> don't find them because they'll find you they'll back. They'll find you back and sting you. <laughs> So that, that being the first pillar, and, and, and I just love that you were able to trans, kind of take that, that those little, that conversation on that data table with yeah. your grandparents, and now it's bottled in this product, it's a story, there's, yep. there's, there's something behind it. And the second pillar, which, which I wanted to kind of touch base on, was the, the, um, the philanthropy part of you, the humanitarian part that, that yeah. is helping these young children. Um, what is the organization called? The organization, and, yeah. yeah. Sorry. You can, you can yeah, ex expand on that. The organization is called Raise the Children International, and it's a registered NPO in South Africa, in the UK, and in the US as well. And like I mentioned earlier, we identify orphans from deep remote rural areas and place them in high-performing schools. Um, we take them from grade 8, 8th grade, all the way to um, 12th grade. We also recruit university graduates to become like mentors. So we place them in those schools. Because you can imagine if you're coming from a rural school, middle of nowhere, and then you go to like a private school like St. Stadium's, kids can be mean, guys. That's the, <laughs> <laughs> that's, right? Yes. That, that's the reality. Yeah. And sometimes you feel like displaced. You feel like you don't belong. And it's true. Like anyone who would, even for you, if you all of a sudden are in a certain circle, like sometimes you feel like, hey, I don't yeah, gel here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, so that's why we actually recruit um, university graduates to sort of like help our, our, our kids with that transaction, uh, with, with that transition. We also um, have um, counselors that we've um, um, hired as well, because you realize that all of us are dealing with all sorts of like traumas. And I think in our culture, uh, we're taught to take things in and sometimes it's not healthy. So that, that, that the body keeps the score, that trauma lives inside you. Sometimes you have all these like chronic pains or whatever, you don't even know, but it's that trauma that's been like it's piling bad, up, yeah. right? So the idea of having ment um, social workers, um, actually counselors, a psychologist is to sort of like help our kids unpack because we want a kid who will uh, exceed academically, um, emotionally and spiritually. We can't expect them to exceed academically if they're not whole emotionally, yeah. they're whole spiritually. So we want them to sort of like be whole. Holistic, yeah. Yeah, through and yeah. through. And how and how are you how are you supporting that organization? Are people um, able to support it? How do people get involved um, into ensuring that it's not just the ones that you have right now, but there's the more that could yeah. be helped, that they could play their part in helping an organization. How do, how does one get involved? Absolutely. So um, so people can can donate. So if you go to our website www.raisethechildren.org, um, there's a button there. You can actually like donate. Um, and if you're in the U.S. as well, so we actually do big fundraisers in Joburg. So if people want to come to our fundraiser in Joburg, it'll be probably around November like this year. We had it um, in November this year. You can do that. But also um, people can give in different forms, right? Time, um, talent, and treasure, right? So we also have mentors that we recruit. So if you are like a young professional and you want to give one hour of your time to a dedicated like orphan every year, and you walk the journey with them, not every year, like a month, you, yeah. you walk the journey with them. And like I said, it's not just about academic, it's really having that someone who they'll look up to. And you can talk about anything, right? Um, we do that. So if you have time and you feel like, listen, I have you know, I want to give two hours a Saturday or whatever over Zoom or whatever, we can definitely facilitate that yeah. because we're always looking for like mentors um, for our kids. Um, talent, um, you know, if you have a special skill like fundraising or whatever, um, we're always welcome to, you know, we, we always welcome anything that people could add that would add value to, I guess, our, our vision. And, yeah. our, and our vision is to make sure that we raise um, you know, ser servant leaders that would then give back to South Africa, be part of building South Africa. Um, and then treasure, that could be like your, your money, right? So if you could donate like five rands to whatever, billion. Yes. I'm sure, I'm sure you guys have it. <laughs> I'm not doubting you guys. <laughs> I believe in you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure somewhere oh, you win a lotto and um, your life changes tomorrow. Yes. Yes. Think about RTC. I love that. Yeah, so in the US, they can also get like um, tax letters, like, you know, like a, a tax write offs. Nice. Um, so it's, regist it's a registered entity in the US as well and in the UK. So in the UK, we usually have our fundraisers at the House of Lords. So we had one in March, um, and you're welcome to um, attend that as well. Yeah. And Gabe. Yeah. Yeah, time, talent, talent and, treasure. and treasure. Yeah. Um, so, I, and I asked this question because, you, you know, earlier on we had said how 
you are able to see the impact of people giving to you, mm. right? And also there are people who are looking to give, I just don't know where to go, right? Yep, they don't know absolutely. how to find those kids. So absolutely. you being the facilitator of that enables them to know that they're giving into this organization and yeah. it's going to be able to help those kids that they wish to reach. Absolutely. Um, and probably, you know, if you have got some dollars, because it goes to Africa and it's, it's 18 times more. So. Exactly. Or pounds. <laughs> or pounds. Guys. <laughs> Pull them through. <laughs> yeah. Like anything. Anything. Yeah. Come yeah. through. Um, yeah. I'm going to leave the details on, on, on the, at the bottom of the screen as well of the, yeah. how you can go about donating. Uh, that's incredible. That's incredible. And then the third pillar being this bridge that you've, you've been able to kind of communicate and live as well between South Africa, the US, and mm. even the Western world in general. Right. Um, and I think that's what brought us then together on Wednesday last week when yes. you were um, bringing the South African product or these South African products to this US market to change the narrative, but to also give the US, the US market and the diaspora a taste of Africa. Totally. T tell us more about Mueli Wines. Yeah. Um, and, and what brought that vision about? Because, you know, one would, one would kind of think that this product here is a very different to that product there. Totally. What 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 crossed the bridge for you to, to kind of having both of them as under uh, under your umbrella? Yeah, I think it goes back to um, what I mentioned earlier about problem solving. It it, it all starts with like problem solving, yeah. um, and I think also when I lived here, um, whenever I would try to find South African wines. I would find something that I would not even buy myself in South Africa. Do you know what I mean? And I think the pleasure of, of the privilege of living in a country that's one of the best wine producing countries in the world oh, yeah. is that we were so spoiled. We're so used to like the best wines. Like even, even our cheapest wines are like the best. <laughs> so you get here and you become slobbish yes. um, in a way because you're used to like the best guys. Um, you have to forgive us. Um, yeah. um, and, I, and I think for me, I was like, it can't be um, if South Africa produces some of the best wines in the world, the wines should be accessible. How is it that South Africa or South Africa has less than 1% market share um, of the American wine market. What is it? You know, are we not marketing ourselves enough? Are we not telling our stories? Like, what is it? I mean, you go to wine shops and you, you see aisles of like Australian wines, New Zealand wines, and they're doing so well promoting their wines. What is our problem, guys? Like, what is our problem? You know, you need to give people something, a piece of Africa, a taste yeah. of Africa. And, um, and I also, um, I think for me, one of the passions uh, um, that I have is like, um, I guess equality um, and making, and I, and I also love fairness um, in like all across any industry. Like I want to see representation all across. So even with foods, like yesterday or the last few days, Malak and I were at the Fancy Food Show. Um, and I think one of, it's great. It's like literally Fancy Food Show brings people from all over the world with like food products. But the black representation is like tiny. And I'm not even talking about black. I'm like people of color. Where are we, guys? Why are we not there? Why are we not growing? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, why are we not taking up? Why are we not owning brands? Why are we not telling our stories? So that's a sorry. That's something that has always sat in my heart, and I've never really felt settled about it. And I felt like something needed to be done. You know, and I can't expect someone else to do it. Like I, I need to do it, and then bring people along. And that's when I started Moedi. I was like, you know. As a young black woman, I want to see products that are made by black women or black men or Latina men or Asian women. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm gonna, I want to pick up something like on the shelves and 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 try it. Do you know what I mean? And um, Muedi is a Setswana name, and I and I was very intentional about using um, an African name, um, also that could be pronounced in any way. So Muedi means yeah. a stream of water in in Setswana and. Really, um, the first miracle in the Bible um, was when Jesus turned water into wine. Mm -hmm. So this is pr pretty much it. Interesting. And water gives life, right? So Moedi means stream of water. So water gives lives to us humans. It gives lives to the dreams and hopes we have. It gives lives to the vines. Um, it gives life to the bees, all of us. We all need water, and water ties us. Um, and so that's the first intro about the name. And I wanted the label to sort of like represent South Africa as well. So you'll see there's like flora, there's like flowers that are mainly like South African, uh, actually all South African. Um, yeah. There's a protea there. Um, and I used the letter M so that people would be able to identify it because when I buy something at the store, sometimes I don't even know what I'm buying, but I love the packaging. <laughs> so I buy with my eye, guys. You know, like, 
Um, and I and I just felt like sometimes you know that that's some, something that was like missing like generally yeah. that traditionally the wine la the wine industry has not been able to like innovate when it comes to like wine labels like bring in like yeah. more more colors um, and I think they've been a little bit more conservative because the wine industry is still like very like old men old white men yeah um, and I felt like we needed to see more young people in it especially for Gen Z Gen Zs and millennials. And um, yeah, and, and um, the wine is run as a social enterprise, so we gave a portion of our profits towards supporting the work that we're doing with female and male beekeepers in South yeah. Africa, rural beekeepers. We also support Raise Your Children through th our pro the proceeds of our profits as well. And um, I wanted um, the wine, Moedi, to be an opportunity. You know, wine, it's excellent wine, and I'm not just saying it, guys. Like, yes. she can also attest. Um, she had it. Great. Um, I also wanted to be an opportunity for someone to play a part in making a difference in South Africa. Yeah. So you may not have an opportunity to go to South Africa or who knows. But when you buy Mowedi, you're buying good wine, but you're also supporting, like, Causes that are transformative are changing yeah. people's lives, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's a, it's it's a piece of Africa, and I, and I think the dream that I've always had is, you know, with everything that America has given me from education to everything, I've always had this dream of like coming back to America and gifting America um, back with wine. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And gifting it with a bit of Africa. Yeah, yeah gifting. A bit of home. Yeah, gifting it with, 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 with a bit of home. But also changing the narrative in terms of like how America engages with Africa. We can be trade partners, right? Yeah. And so one of the things that I love um, that American government has provided is AGOA. So AGOA is like trade incentives where we actually pay like little less, actually between the wine and the honey is like reduced tariffs which makes us more competitive like in the market. So compared to what the tariffs that European countries pay and um, other countries pay to bring in their products. So I think America has been super generous with Africa by making sure that we get in and we can become competitive. Yeah. So we're taking full advantage of that with our wine and honey. I think it's one of those products that when you see on the shelf, you're like, hmm. What's the story behind this brand? What's yeah. the story behind, yeah. you know, it's, it's just eloquently put together. No, thank you. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's time we get a taste of South Africa. We get a taste of not even the country, but you as well and your story yeah. and your journey. Yeah. Um, what is your hope then by bringing this, this brand over here? What are you hoping the American audience will, um, you know, pick it, take, take it forward and grow with it, grow it in the country? Yeah. What's your trajectory for that? Yeah, so America is um, an exciting market for us, and uh, one because it's a it's a market that I have a personal connection with and a deep connection with, and I do feel like our stories are in a way like interconnected, um, you know, like in different ways. So, for example, California is like the fourth biggest economy like in the world. So when it comes to like scale, um, I know that. Moedi has an opportunity to actually grow like in the in the US market and like I said we only have less than 1% market share so our hope is that we could actually like increase that yeah. um, by scaling our product um, we want Moedi to resonate with millennials Gen Z's in America we want someone to pick a bottle and take it to their friend and we want Moedi to be like a conversation starter around like dinner tables I don't know if people still do that here, when you go to someone's house, you don't go empty-handed, guys. Yes. You bring something. something. <laughs> you bring a bottle of wine. So imagine, like, you know. Um, some witty. Yeah, you bring some witty. And you have, like, interesting conversation around the dinner table. Yeah. You talk about how each of you could, like, impact the environment. Um, and you taste Africa. So even if you may not have gone to Africa, but you know that the wine is, like, $22, you know, when you, when you buy it. Um, but that's your experience, that's your intro to like Africa. Yeah. And you doing that, you are actually changing lives back in South Africa. So we're hoping to like scale um, in California. So these are the markets where we'll be uh, growing. Um, California, um, Texas, Florida, um, New York, um, and Connecticut, and a bit of Massachusetts as well. Okay. Um, so you will see a lot of us in um, the next few months and then the next few years. I'll be here doing activations. Our team will be here doing activations. We'll be like everywhere. We want to do more collaborations with like young American entrepreneurs as well. Sort of like just doing that exchange of like ideas and like culture and fusion. Like last week we did like the fashion 
um, you know, wine tasting, yeah. which is like super nice for Juneteenth, yeah. like how amazing, like meeting American creatives who are also connected to like Africa in a way. So would love to be part of like major festivals, like the Essence um, festivals coming up in New Orleans. So we're hoping to be there next year. And also bringing like, giving you a taste of like Moedi and Mapiano, like giving you a taste Ooh. and feel of like Africa, guys. We're yeah. bringing Africa to you. So you don't have to come, we'll come to we'll you. We'll come to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's definitely, as you're saying, like, uh, you know, and this, the culture here being very much, you know, brand centric, right? A yeah. lot of things are brand centric, PR centric. So having to have that particular type of product that when people want to start conversations, yeah. bring a Mwedi wine bottle to a dinner, yeah. we'll have a conversation started. Exactly. Right? They'll be like, oh, exactly. what does this name mean? Yeah. Oh, let me tell you guys. Yeah. So, exactly. <laughs> in South Africa. Exactly. Exactly. So that, that in itself really kind of, you know, aids um, in the storytelling element to it. And I, and I just absolutely love it. I think it's going to do absolutely well in the country. Oh, um, and I think Americans and the American market is ready for more of what Africa is because as you said the narrative has always been the poverty the, yeah. the, the, the hungry exactly but now with, 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 the, with the exchange of, of music and culture yeah. being exported now it's like what else do these Africans and these Africans have to offer exactly exactly so this is one of those products absolutely and we want you to experience the vibes guys like the culture the cuisine I mean, we had a there was a chef here earlier. Yeah, yeah. We want you to experience like the fashion. I mean, we're such a colorful country, like we have vibes. So we want to bring that. We want you guys to experience that. I saw I saw uh, something on social media. I think yesterday that said South Africans are the friendliest people in the world. Oh my goodness, <laughs> guys, like, it's true. It's true. <laughs> it is true. It's true. It's, uh, it's <laughs> true, and, and that's why we because we are so friendly. We are bringing yeah. you a beautiful great tasting wine as well like and that, the best and some the of the best. best in the world i mean our shenan so our wines are from a region called swatland yeah and swatland is known for its shenan blanc we are the top producers of shenan blanc in the world and it's like the best guys so dryland farming granite soils i mean i mean what else can i say mediterranean weather so when you drink this shenan like in the summer day like this like chilled I mean, and you're binge watching like Netflix, you'll, if you're not careful, you'll finish that bottle. <laughs> like that's how nice it is. <laughs> With popcorns. <laughs> With popcorns. Take us actually through the product line. Take us through the product line and I'm hoping that we can get this camera to come. Um, we'll kind of zoom it in a little bit. Take us through the, the different products that you, I think really there's three at the moment. Yeah, there's three. The product line, yes. Yeah, yeah. so there's three. Um, and then we have a bubbly coming up called Black Bee. Um, and so this is our um, 2022 Shiraz. Um, and what I love about the Shiraz is that it has this like peppery um, taste to it. Um, so, so black pepper with a bit of like herbs. So it's like well balanced and it pairs really well with like hamburger, right? Which is uh, apparently America's staple food. Like it's, yes. it's the national meal here. <laughs> yes. That's why I didn't bring any like steakhouse, whatever. Yes, like, you burned it. Guys, you're tired. You want to grab a hamburger from, well, I'm not going to give free advertising. Yes. No, yes. we were only promoting yeah. the wedding today. So this is what you can have it with. Um, and if you want to take someone out on a date or be creative at home and cook a piece of steak or duck, I mean, I know there's some guys or some girls who take it that level. That's it, that's this it. is your baby. Nice. Like, you're guaranteed. It's sealed. It's sealed, okay? That'll be date number two. That'll be date, yeah, that'll be date. <laughs> That'll be date number two. Uh, oh, requesting it at a restaurant. If you're that yeah. guy, you're like, I want more wines for my date. Exactly. Right? So, and restaurant, make sure you, next time we come, you have more wines. Yeah, the, restaurant. Yeah. So, yes. even if it's, next time you go to a restaurant, just ask them for more wedding. Yes. Yeah. And if not, just tell them to make a plan. To make a plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, this one is the, is the okay. So Yeah, so this is a red. Okay, yeah, this is a, a Shiraz. And you see it has like a gold medal. And it's because it got a gold, um, it was um, rated by the French um, company called um, Gilbert and Gillard, and it got 80, 87 points, um, which means that it's good, good wine. Um, so we're not just selling you, like we're selling you like the real things, quality, guys. Quality. Like quality. Yeah. And then we have the Movedro Rosé, which is also, I mean, they're all my favorite, but I feel like this one is like my girl <laughs> because it's a rosé. I mean, you know how girls love yes. the pink, right? <laughs> 
Um, so rosé, that's our 2023 rosé. Yeah. Uh, the fermentation was in a steel tank. Um, so it has like notes of like watermelon and it has notes of like um, pomegranate and it's like fruity and refreshing, like balanced acidity. I mean, it's not, it's like your it's friend. Not. It's nice. <laughs> like it's just feminine. It's yeah. just, guys, even for guys, it's cool. It's good. Yeah. It's cool. And it's a wine that I would drink all year round. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So I wouldn't even wait for the summer, guys. For the summer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then our last one over here in the and, center. Yeah. So our last one is um, a Chenin Blanc. Like I said, South Africa is known for its Chenin Blanc, one of the biggest producers and the best producers of Chenin Blanc in the world. Um, so this is also like crisp, refreshing with like nodes of like apples and, you know, crisp pear and it's perfumey as well. And it pairs really well with like, chicken or, or, or fish or any like um, shell, um, um, uh, what do you call it, um, fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so this actually goes well with like, and even with popcorns, I, I drink this with popcorn <laughs> when I'm watching, when I'm binge watching. Bit of binge watching. Yeah, yeah, no, Netflix, please, this is like your baby. Um, yeah, and um, and also it, it also scored really high okay. um, recently when we, when we did the... The, I guess when we when we when we got the tests yeah. uh, from Gilbert and Gillard, and yeah, it's it's great. It's really nice. Um, it's very really refreshing. And we have another one called um, Black Bee. It's about it's a bubbly. So that one will come probably early next year, like in the January. Okay. Um, and it's pretty much Chardonnay and um, Pinot Noir. And I'm a I'm a bubbles girl. So Black Bee is like your it's girl. Really yeah. <laughs> Now that we've kind of had a little bit of a presentation, everyone's probably like, okay, I want this wine. Right now, where do I go get it? Okay, so the wine will be available in the American market from the first week of August, like August 1st. Yeah. And um, there's a website that's coming called www.mowedywines.com. Currently, we have mowedywines.africa, yeah. um, but there's a US-specific US site, and then the wine will also be available at select stores, like in Connecticut, if, at the Bevmore's, you'll be able to get Mowedi wines. But if you follow us on our socials, you'd be able to get all that information, but the wines will officially be available for purchase from August 1st yes, in the US. Yes, of course, and the goal is to also get it to as many restaurants, as many stores. Restaurants, um, stores, yeah. Yeah, and if you are in that line of work and have some information on how we can get, because we want to stack this up in as many restaurants and as many stores as possible. Absolutely, that's the in goal. In the country, so yeah. reach out to Mubedi Wines, Please, and if you know someone who knows someone. Know someone? Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Let's yeah. make it happen. Man, this is absolutely beautiful. And, I, and I'm sure you mentioned earlier on that you, you've got kids yourself. I do. Um, I do. How are, how are they receptive to, to, your, to this journey of yours, seeing you travel the world, um, telling your story, but also sharing beautiful products with the world? How is their reception to, to all of this? I think so. I have three boys and they just love it. Yeah. And I think for me, I just wanted to be an example of like, a mom who tries to be there for them even for like their recitals or whatever but also seeing me pursue things that i um that i'm passionate about i think they've, they've been very supportive they're like mom we're so proud of you yeah. so whenever there's like school projects where you have to talk about like a hero like without me persuading them or anything they always tell tell me like mom you know i did this thing at school today and it was like about you being like our hero so the whole school knows about you <laughs> um and it's so nice because i think for boy um children um to see you as a mom doing that because i want them to be able to support their wives i don't want them to hold their wives back when their wives have like dreams and i'm like even if you're a stay-at-home dad it's okay like <laughs> support your wife yeah. and i think me exampling being an example of that i think it's it's been great and it's hard sometimes because i have to leave them i can't travel with them luckily i'm in the u.s and i'm traveling with them and i'm grateful for that privilege but um yeah they they are very understanding and i have a very understanding husband as well so yeah it's just finding i would say finding that person who will be supportive of like your your vision your goals because going back to our conversation earlier it's bigger than us right yeah. it's it's like ministry for for me this is like ministry i know it's wine and alcohol but this is ministry yes <laughs> it's it's bringing it's bringing joy to, it's bringing, to yeah. conversations it's starting Absolutely. conversations and doing something that's like life giving yeah 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 that's beautiful and and i love that you are also an example to young women you know, um, who can you. look up to you and say, if she can do it, so can I. Yeah. If she can 
be a mom, be a wife, and run these successful businesses and travel the world, then why can't I? Because we've Absolutely. been kind of, kind of given this idea that you can only choose one. Mm. You can't have all. You yeah. can't have it all. You yeah. must choose which, yeah. which party are you going to join. Yeah. But seeing that it's possible is, yeah. is I think, such such an inspiration um, to to many women out there. Who, oh, thank you. Who are watching your journey. No, thank you. And I think it goes back to, like, for example, if you have kids or you have a partner, even if you don't have kids, is like finding that person who will understand that you have a vision. You know, you also have dreams and. Everything is about compromise in life, but yeah. never compromise things that are life giving because you'll have a miserable life. And it's it's not easy, but love you first. Learn to be selfish and put yourself first. And yeah. And I think also another another set of people that might be proud of you right now are your parents. Yeah. As they're looking down and oh. you know, I'm sure they are smiling yeah. and, and proud yeah. of of what they were able to bring to this world, the gift that they shared with the world, which is you. Yeah. And now you are sharing your gift with the world, helping other people's dreams come through, helping other people's memories come alive. Yeah. So I'm sure they're looking and um, yeah. very proud of themselves for, for, for raising you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> no, thank you. Now you're going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, but thank you, Bria. That is really um, special because, like, I said earlier, like, you know, I, I go back, I visit their graves and I look at the soil that's piled over and I'm like, these are all the hopes and dreams like buried, like yeah. they, that's it, like you're gone. So I think us being very intentional about every day. Um, yeah, and the word for, for, for this year for me is like intentionality. We have to be very intentional. So even if life is, things are hard and yeah, I think living with intention, you know, because tomorrow's not guaranteed. We yeah. see, we saw during COVID that there were people with like people that we know with like amazing dreams anything could happen yeah so pursue that thing that you've had in your heart you don't have to have everything in i'm telling you guys you don't have to work for there's never a perfect time you want to pursue something go for it things will fall into place Mm. things will fall into place like you don't have what it's fine (laughs) you'll see when you get there (laughs) and intentionally today i didn't want us to even touch base on the challenges that and i'm sure they're they're mammoth of different challenges that you because yeah. you, you don't get to where you are without yeah, challenges right absolutely. so i'm sure there's many challenges but i wanted to necessarily today showcase and, and highlight uh, then what what the success of this brand and this business yeah. to build um and and kind of so that we can be able to take strength from that because sometimes if we we look at how it could get we're like okay let absolutely. me keep going let me keep yeah. holding on yeah because it, it's gonna get good absolutely it's gonna get good so i think your journey really is is an inspiration oh, to, to so many i remember when i was listening to you speak at the at the launch i was like i need to sit down with this lady oh. <laughs> i need to sit down with this lady and i think your story is, is very powerful and and that's gonna transcend even with what you do right it's 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 gonna then go forth into the world and and be received because it's coming from a very genuine place Mm, from your heart from you know from that dinner table with your grandfather from you know it comes from that so we we feel it and we see it and we experience it and we're gonna taste it through your products (laughs) (laughs) so um and i was about to ask you for your last final words what would you like to leave us with um you know, as, as this, this journey is beginning, this American US market expansion is beginning, what words would you like to leave us with? Anyone who's watching from yeah. different parts of the world, yeah. uh, what would you say to them? Well, I actually had a, a, a conversation with someone yesterday, and um, she's a mom, and about she's expecting um, again, and she was just telling me about all the streams she's had about being a pilot and how she feels like all of that is going down the drain. I'm like, why? She's like, well, and now I'm expecting my second child. So I'm like, I mean, you, that, that that's not a life sentence. Like, yeah. I think the best thing that you can do for you, for yourself as a mom is actually pursuing the things that you're passionate about. Obviously there's, the, there's uh, times, there's a time for everything. There's a time for you to be the primary caretaker and this and that, but then whatever goal and dream that God has put in your heart, pursue it don't let it die you know what i mean at all costs and break it down start with like baby steps you know if you're saving save up for like something like for because she wants to be a pilot so save up for the the tuition fees save up for this and i know sometimes it's like hard because anything can come up a funeral or whatever but be intentional you have to be really intentional um and surround yourself with people that are positive and and honestly sometimes you'd find that you're you feel like you're 
in this journey alone, especially when you go through things. But just stay strong. Like, you're not alone. God is with you. Um, and, yeah, and, and I just thinking about the wine, it was really hard because South Africa is, the South African wine industry is still less diverse. There's not a lot of people, black people in general, or people of color in the wine industry. So coming up and, 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 and being very focused on creating Mwedi, it was difficult at times because people were like, oh, this is not going to last, this mm. and that, you know? Um, and because black people's roles were pretty much, we were put in a place where we could either be serving, we could either be working in wine farms or, or doing X, Y, Z in the yeah. admin, but never us owning our own brands and our own stories. And that was hard. And this is still a war that I'm still fighting. Yeah. Um, but you need to know who you are. You, you, you need to fight for what you want. Don't relent and, um, and sometimes be ruthless. You know, because you know who God is. You know, sometimes God, God is like, you know, we need to like stand up and like yeah. t tear down tear, like the stronghold. Yeah. If someone is taking something from you, get up. Don't cry. You can cry a little bit. Get up and just like, like claim it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there's a there's a quote on social media kind right now. It's like be a bad girl. Yes, bad. <laughs> be a bad to, girl. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Whatever it takes, but a good bad girl. <laughs> the good bad girl. She's like, good girls don't get the corner office. I know. <laughs> you fight. Someone says something nasty, you address yes, them. Yeah, call yes. them to order. And we've been given the responsibility of, of being being intentional. Yeah. You know, and the timidness, the, the holding mm -hmm. back, it's not it's not part of, I, I don't think it's part of God's plan for us to just be timid. No. And not go forth and, and experience the goodness that is out there. That he's Absolutely. prepared for us. He is prepared for us. You know, he's just prepared to for go us. And, and take it. And doors are going to be shut on our face like many times. You're going to be told that you're not qualified, you're not this, you're not, but, but keep going. And I would say your, your network, you always hear the saying, your network is your net worth reach out to your friends, like reach out to people in your community, like reach out to your people that you went to school, university with, like you just never know who they know. So I know sometimes we're like, oh, what, what will people say? What will people think? Like you need to leave all of that behind. It's not about you. Just go out there, 10 doors, get shut on your face, call the next door, the next door, keep going. Yes, keep going. Oh yeah. my God, this was such an enriching comment. I don't want to. I don't want to stop now. Like, let's keep going. <laughs> um, but this is so enriching. This is really, I think, a catch up that we're having. Really getting to know each other. Absolutely. In this sense, and and I'm learning so much, and I'm hoping you at home have been, you know, learning and taking notes and um, helping grow in this conversation and, mm. and growing as as we are having it. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank for you me. for everything that you're doing. Keep and we're gonna keep encouraging and keep supporting. Oh, um, as I can I can only imagine um, how difficult it can get. Yeah. But knowing that there are people who they might not be saying anything, they might just be there on Instagram or but we're here supporting and we're here rooting for oh, you all the thank way. Thank you. I appreciate uh, it so yeah. much. Even being here like it means a lot to us. <laughs> yeah. Right here on the Bio Show we're gonna be supporting my wedding wines. When it comes to wines, we're gonna be promoting my wedding wines, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me and thank you at home for tuning in. This is, of course, the Your Show. And um, uh, we are definitely, definitely, definitely hoping that you learned a lot, a thing or two from this conversation and really were inspired and ignited to go forth and reach for your dreams as well, wherever you are around the world. We had an incredible time with Yusejo, yeah. Wedding Wines, and we hope that you're going to go out and get yourself a bottle, okay? Or a bit of the Be Loved Honey yes. as well. Um, August 1st is when you can expect and anticipate to get yourself a bottle as it will be officially launching here in the US on August 1st. Moodywines.com is where you go yep. to get it. And um, we'll leave all the details in the description below. So don't worry, we got you. Okay. <laughs> all right, from Lucidi and Lucero and I, it is goodbye and have yourself a fantastic day, ladies and gents. We love you. Mwah! Cheers for now. Thanks, guys.